Good evening, Booktube. I'm sitting here in the dining room. It is June the 17th. It's a Saturday. It is 8, 8.30. No, it's 8.40 at night. It is 82 degrees inside the house. We got everything opened up. It's supposed to be in the 70s tomorrow, and it's supposed to rain tonight. It's been raining, and it's been hot, so everything is just going berserk, the, the plant life. I'm going to have to go in our backyard at least next week and start chopping stuff down, mow the lawn. So... So I'm sitting here reading uh, tonight. Tonight is Saturday, uh, The Works of William Perkins, Volume 4. I'm still reading his exposition on the whole epistle of Jude, which is in the New Testament. It's You have the general epistle of Jude, and then you have the last uh, book of the New Testament, the Revelation of St. John the Divine. And I'm on verse 6. Uh, it starts out, uh, there's only one chapter in Jude. Uh, it's only 25 verses. And I am down to verse 6, which Paul well, started reading at verse 1. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called, mercy unto you in peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God in our Lord Jesus Christ. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. Now, I've been reading uh, William Perkins on verse 6 tonight. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. So I was reading here tonight about the judgment of the great day. And it was kind of sobering. That's one thing uh, when you read a commentary on, on Holy Scripture, the Word of God, it's not like you're reading a novel or reading a history book or, well, a history book is, yeah, because what you're reading in history is something that actually took place or someone's observation of what that event was in history. History is always being reinterpreted as maybe we get more information through archaeological sites or things are found from the past that shed light on those events that we don't have at the present moment. But the point I'm trying to say is that when you read the Bible, this is not just fantasy or some imaginary world or it's, it's fiction. It's, it's not, it's make-believe. No, the, there is a great day of judgment. I mean, and the, that's something as I have to live with as a Christian, that there is a great day, the judgment of the great day. And so I was reading this tonight, just meditating upon it. And I was reading something uh, how do you say it? Yeah, the great day of judgment. The third point in this example is the punishment 
of the angels, which has two, two degrees. First, their custody in these words. He reserved them, namely endurance. Secondly, their full punishment unto the judgment of the great day. The former is set forth in two things. First, that they are reserved in chains. Secondly, under darkness by these chains are signified first that the mighty power of God, which bridles and restrains the might and malice of the devils themselves, as the old dragon was bound for a thousand years. Revelations 20, verse 3. The power of God was, was the chain that curbed and overmastered him. And this is one part of this present punishment. Secondly, the chain signify also the guilt and guiltness of the angels, which by the tender of God's justice binds them over to destruction. These bounds are upon the conscience of the wicked angels. They know they are judged to damnation for their sin. So let them be where they will, in the earth or air or whatsoever. These chains of guilty consciences bind them over to judgment, where we are taught two things. First, to beware of guilty and accusing conscience, for these are God's chains binding body and soul into everlasting vengeance. And therefore, for time past, if your conscience accuses you, seek in due time to be loosed and freed by Christ, that you may be able to say with Paul, I know nothing by myself. And for time to come, beware of sin, even small sins as well as great, for so many sins as you commit are so many chains binding you over to just damnation. Secondly, hence we also learn that the service of God is a most happy and sweet liberty. Any liberty else is straight bondage. Men think that to be tied to the daily service of God is a yoke and intolerable bondage, and they must needs have liberty to sin. But they deceive themselves, for while they seek for liberty, by this means they plunge themselves into captivity and lay chains upon themselves, yea, bolts which hold them in eternal bondage. The liberty which is sweet unto those who are freed by Christ is that they can walk before God in the compass of their callings, callings without those accusing consciences, which continually vex and torment the wicked men and angels themselves. And then it goes down here, it says, the second degree of their punishment is that they are reserved unto the judgment of the great day, wherein the fullness and extremity of their torment is expressed for by judgment is meant that fearful and final condemnation and torment which they are adjudged unto, which abides them and is reserved for them. Where we see that who, who, howsoever the devils are already entered into the diverse degrees of their punishment, yet their full punishment and the full wrath of God is not powered or poured upon them into the last judgment. This they, they themselves know, and, are, and he quotes here in Matthew, 8 verse 29 art thou come to torment us before the time that's what the demons said to christ when he was going to cast them out art thou come to torment us before the time that time is called here the great day because the greatest works of god shall be accomplished in that day for first an assembly of all men and angels shall be made by the sound of a trumpet who shall be cited before god's judgment seat though they were resolved into dust many thousands of years before. Secondly, all the works and intentions of men, good or bad, shall be in that day revealed. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 14. Thirdly, another great work is the giving of a most upright sentence upon all men of absolution unto the godly and of condemnation upon the wicked angels and men. Fourthly, the reward shall be given to every man according to his work, to the godly free reward of life and glory, to the wicked deserve condemnation. Fifthly, then shall Christ, God and man, give up his kingdom unto the Father, and shall cease to reign not as God, for he shall be equal to his Father. But as mediator, for an end shall be put to all families, societies, civil, ecclesiastical distinctions, and governments, so as in regard of outward government and administration of his kingdom shall cease. Use, 
Let the remembrance of this great day strike us with fear and reverence of it. You know, that's one thing. That, you know, if there is this great day of judgment, it should strike us with fear and reverence. Shall every worker be brought unto judgment? Then let us fear God and keep his commandments. It is the use that Solomon makes in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13. In considering those terrors of the Lord, what matter of men ought we to be in all holy matter of life? says the Lord. Yea, the devils themselves believe and tremble in remembrance of this terrible and great day. But how many atheists there be, worse than the devils themselves, that make a mock of these great works, not fearing nor acknowledging the scriptures, heaven, hell, God, devil, nor the great judgment day. But experience shall teach such fools who in the meantime might learn so much of the devil himself, but that God has given them into his hand to be led by his will, to tremble at the remembrance of this dreadful day, and let all that love the Lord shake off security and stand in awe and fear with another fear. Let their hearts be smitten with reverence, reverent fear that the, this day overtakes them not unawares. So yeah, that's what I'm doing tonight. I'm just here meditating upon that great day of judgment. And that's what every day, uh, you live in the light of the day of judgment. You, that's one thing that you realize that this life is is swiftly passing and you're here for a moment and then you're into eternity and there is that the judgment of the great day and it's it's blessed to know that in Jesus Christ there is but forgiveness of sins that once we come to Christ there is as it says um, Paul says in Romans chapter 8 he says uh, it's a very famous verse says, therefore there is now no condemnation to them that which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. So, there is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. But if you are in Christ Jesus and there is no condemnation, how do you know that you're in Christ Jesus? It says here, because you walk not after the flesh, but you walk after the Spirit. You, you, live, a, you live in obedience to God's Word. You, you seek to live in the light of God's Holy Word and seek to conform your life unto it. And then you don't have this guilty conscience. You know, he mentions here, William, about an accusing conscience. I remember... When I was in the state of sin, how my conscience was always accusing me. And what a blessed thing it is to know that once you come to Christ and you've been forgiven of your sins and you've declared righteous and just before God, that your conscience is appeased, it's quiet. Now, and then, but it's not that your, your conscience stops working as a Christian because you're always very aware that you're always trying to walk in that certain way. And when your conscience is awakened by maybe just a, a, an inward thought of lust or something, maybe you're tempted to do something that is contrary to God's word, listen to your conscience. Don't harden your heart. Don't, don't silence your conscience. But, but, you know, that's not going to save you. Some people think, well, I'll just live according to my conscience. No. Because in the end, we're, God demands perfect obedience, perfect fulfillment according to his law. And we're all going to fail. We're all going to not only sin outwardly, but inwardly. Maybe we don't live a life of sin anymore as Christians, but we can never totally love God perfectly. And our conscience tells us that. But so we have to flee to Christ and that for salvation that is in Christ. So I don't know, I'm reading William Perkins, reading Theology of the New Testament, Frank Thielman. I was reading the, he has a chapter here on Jude. I was reading that tonight. Jude, contending for the faith against a perversion of God's grace. And I remember uh, years ago when I taught Jude at a church, I read this very famous uh, Puritan commentary by Reverend William Jenkins. This is Exposition on the Epistle of Jude. 
this was first published in, I think it was first published, oh, back in the, I say the 17th century. This is a reprint. It's not an original 17th century. This is a reprint. It's huge. You know, look at that. Look at that small print. And it's over, uh, it's about 400 pages, a small print. I, I read this thing when I was uh, teaching Jude. I also use the more modern books when I taught Jude. Second Peter and Jude, an exposition commentary by D. Amon Hebert. I use this one really a lot. I noticed when I got it out this evening that it was falling apart. Uh, I used it when I was when I was taught Jude. I also taught First and Second Peter and Jude, and I use this a lot. I noticed I underlined it a lot in here. Usually I don't underline books, but I noticed that when I was using this teaching Jude, no, First Second Peter and Jude. Anyway, it's a good commentary. This is the Word Biblical Commentary, Jude and Second Peter by Richard J. Buckingham. It's a good, these are good resources if you want to study Jude. Can't go wrong reading uh, William Jenkins, the old Puritan on, on Jude. And of course, here I am reading William Perkins on Jude and his works. The fourth volume just came out. So that's what I'm reading tonight. Uh, probably, I know I'm going to read tomorrow. Tomorrow's a Sunday. I'll probably keep reading Jude. Next week I'll just go back into reading other books. So I hope that you're having a good night. I just want to just share these things. And until next time, bye.